Hey there. Um, so in this second uh, lecture series, actually I'm not sure if it's going to be one or two videos this time. Um, hopefully, not, hopefully not three. Uh, this week what I want to do is just briefly rehearse what we went over in class before we turned to our discussion of uh, Virginia Woolf's um, Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, a book that, as I told the class on Tuesday, I spend an inordinate amount of time uh, thinking about. Um, a book that keeps me up at night. A book, uh, one of the books, one of the many books uh, to which I've decided to dedicate my life uh, in terms of uh, reading, studying, and, and, and teaching um, others, others how to read. But before I get to Mrs. Dalloway, I just wanted to very quickly uh, rehearse for us the uh, quote-unquote method that of new criticism that I covered last week and which I hope uh, you've um, studied on your own, uh, that you've read and taken notes on from the Parker book, and that you may have even taken notes on by watching last week's lecture series too. So, but... Uh, so I just want to review the the, the sort of four-step new critical method that we draw from uh, Parker's Parker's book Parker the the author of our main textbook How to Interpret Literature. So uh, step one, isolate the text. Step two, notice a problem. I spent quite a bit of time trying to uh, explain what sort of problem uh, in, in the last lecture series, but two, notice a problem. Step three, track this problem as it recurs, maybe in various forms across the text. And step four, what I'm now calling jazz hands. Uh, uh, in other words, the, the uh, sort of sudden demonstration that the repetition of this problem uh, of this evidence of disunity is actually the key to understanding the way in which the text, um, because, well, if it is uh, great literature, manages to harmonize and balance um, balance um, apparent disunities into some kind of harmony or some kind of unity. I have uh, our dear friend Cleanth Brooks with me here and just... <clears throat> just to uh, read a little bit of it for us, read a little bit of Brooks for us. Um, this is from page 195 of the, well, you don't have the book maybe, but page 195 of my copy of the Well-Wrought Urn. Uh, Brooks has just stated that maybe what his version or his ideal version of interpreting literature should entail is the discovery, understanding, and demonstration of how the structure of a literary text works, or for him, how the structure of a particular poem might work. The important question to ask is, what do you mean by structure? Right? What do you mean by structure? Or what do you mean by form? If instead of structure, we're using the word form. Brooks writes, The structure meant is a structure of meanings, evaluations, and interpretations. And the principle of unity, which informs it, seems to be one of balancing and harmonizing connotations rather than denotations, attitudes and meanings, meaning that there are competing attitudes within a single poem and certainly within our novel, uh, Mrs. Dalloway. But even here, one needs to make important qualifications. The principle is not one which involves the arrangement of various elements into homogeneous groupings, pairing like with like. It unites, in other words, the like with the unlike, right, into a harmony, into a balance. Remember his thesis that the language of poetry or the language of literature is a language of paradox, right? The balancing or the harmonization of like with unlike uh, by way of a kind of metaphorical, not a kind of, but by way of metaphor and analogy um, and figurative language. It does not unite them, however, he continues, by the simple process of allowing one connotation to cancel out another one, nor does it reduce the contradictory attitudes in, in each poem to harmony by a process of subtraction. It's not as if the competing attitudes or contradictions 
or elements of a paradox within a literary text um, constitute a battle that has one victor, right? So that you have a sort of winning and losing attitude in the literary text, but rather they work together in some sense, competing and collaborating. The unity is not a, is not a unity of the sort to be achieved by the reduction and simpli simplification appropriate to an algebraic formula. It is a positive unity, not a negative. It re represents not a residue, but an achieved harmony. In other words, great literature for Brooks is the kind of literature that doesn't just directly state some kind of moral or communicate some kind of message, but is, is the working out and the balancing of um, paradoxical ideas that enable the poem to, let's say, express a more complicated idea in the only way that poetry can, um, or generalizing Brooks's point, the only way that literature can which is by grouping together and bringing about a unity among uh, discrepant uh, and disparate elements, even contradictory and conflicting ones. Okay. So this is what I mean by jazz hands, that it, the fourth step of the new critical method, that it, at some point the critic needs to move from simply tracking a kind of discontinuity across a literary text and show that it is actually key to bringing about a kind of harmonious unity um, uh, a kind of significant, let's say, uh, balance among elements that otherwise would be would be at odds with each other. Okay. Uh, last week, uh, we looked at the poem, Wilfred Owen's poem, Dulce et Decorum Est, tried to show the ways in which, uh, way in which the odd description of ecstasy within, within a battle scene, um, while initially um, out of place, in, in a poem like that, uh, actually helped the poem express uh, an attitude, a complex of attitudes toward war, um, <clears throat> especially toward the condition of the soldiers that experience war um, and experience life after battles, that is really, really about a kind of an odd perpetual oscillation between trances and um, what was what was the other thing? Trances and excitations, maybe sort of manic manic states of, um, of of fumbling, as it were, for gas masks. But anyway, some sort of oscillation between those states, and that the poem's word ecstasy is this perfect encapsulation of both of those all at once. Okay, so that was what I tried to show last week. Okay, so this week we're talking about a much larger, larger text, right? That's a twenty-eight line poem, I think, and this is a two hundred page novel. By no means the longest novel in the world, but still much longer than uh, than a double sonnet. Um, so how would we go about doing something like that? Okay. How would we go about pursuing a new critical reading of a novel like Mrs. Dalloway? Well, the first thing is we have to isolate the text. But what does that mean? Right. This is an important step because implicit in that step is the idea that the literary, that the new critic actually knows a great deal about the author's life. Knows a great deal, maybe, even, about what the author has to say about his or her own work, works of literature, or maybe just literature in general. That the literary critic does know a great deal about history, and a great deal about the development of literary history. And so the first step only makes sense, isolate the text, if the critic always already, not always already, bracket that out, if the cr critic already knows a great deal. Okay. So with that in mind, maybe oddly, the first step is actually to learn a little bit about what Virginia Woolf herself has to say about her own, about literature and about Mrs. Dalloway in particular. If you go into Sakai, you'll find uh, a, a handout of quotes that, um, a handout that includes quotes from an introduction that Woolf wrote to her novel. Uh, three years after its publication, uh, an introduction for uh, uh, an American edition of the novel. Uh, it's a very short introduction. She just she really doesn't say very much about Mrs. Dalloway, but she says some pretty interest. Nevertheless, some little uh, what she calls um, odds and ends that um, are pretty interesting. I've also included some passages from her diary, um, her diary when she was working on Mrs. Dalloway that are that is actually also. Uh, pretty fascinating. 
and also a passage from her very important essay, Modern Fiction, which appeared in a collection of essays called The Common Reader, which, as it turns out, was published the exact same year as Mrs. Dalloway. And so Mrs. Dalloway is, maybe, is interesting to us if we're interested in Wolfe's biography, uh, partly because at the same time that she's working on Mrs. Dalloway, she's working on a book of essays about literature at the same time. So she, she's al already thinking at a kind of meta level about how literature works, how she, how she wants her own literature to work, and, and, um, and actually about all the literature of the past in her own tradition as an English writer that she admires. Right. So anyway, I just want to read one of the quotes from this handout, and it's the bottom one, okay? Um, the bottom one taken from her essay, Modern Fiction. Okay. She says, examine, or she writes, examine for a moment an ordinary mind on an ordinary day. The mind receives a myriad impressions, trivial, fantastic, evanescent, or engraved with the sharpness of steel. From all sides they come, an incessant shower of innumerable atoms. And as they fall, as they shape themselves into the life of Monday or Tuesday, the accent falls differently from of old. The moment of importance came not here, but there. Let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind, as they fall upon the mind. In the order in which they fall, let us trace the pattern, however disconnected and incoherent in appearance, which each sight or incident scores upon the consciousness. Let us not take it for granted that life exists more fully in what is commonly thought big than in what is commonly thought small. Nothing, no method, no experiment, even of the wildest, is forbidden, or should be forbidden. Everything is the proper stuff of fiction. Every feeling, every thought, every quality of brain and spirit is drawn upon. No perception comes amiss. End quote. That's the end of that quote. It is incredibly tempting, a, a new critic would point out, to make Wolf's description of what fiction can be, um, the sort of standard or the ground or the primary evidence for how we perceive Mrs. Dalloway itself to be operating. It's incredibly tempting, after all, to look at those pages in which Wolf seems to be recording thoughts, right, the atoms as they fall upon the minds of Septimus Smith, of Clarissa Dalloway, of Peter Walsh, but the new critic would ask us to say, to hold on a minute and isolate the text from what Wolf has to say, or at the very least, use what Wolf has to say, not as evidence, not as evidence, not as the key to how the text means and how the text brings about a harmony among discrepant elements, but instead, maybe just a kind of supplement or a kind of aid uh, to our own understanding of what is, in fact, a very complicated novel, uh, and not to reduce what it might mean to what Wolf says. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So it's important to note, again, and I'm, I'm saying this, um, I think I've said this in the last lecture series, new critics uh, of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even those who, who even uh, liter literature professors who still prefer new criticism as a mode of doing their scholarship or even of teaching literature, um, that they often get a bad rap because it, uh, people sort of stupidly claim that they think history doesn't matter or biography doesn't matter. Again, they, maybe some of them do, but uh, Cleanth Brooks certainly didn't think that. Uh, Wimson and Beardsley, the authors of two very important essays, The Intentional Fallacy and the, and the Affective Fallacy, certainly didn't think that either. But rather, what they thought, um, uh, if I can attribute to Brooks uh, the, the arguments of Wimson and Beardsley, is that we, we don't necessarily have access to the full complexity of what an author meant in a work of literature. 
that author's intentions change. Um, that, and that we shouldn't conflate the standard of our own readings with the cause of the novel itself um, or the poem itself. That a text like Mrs. Dalloway is not just a sort of static outcome of an intention, but is a dynamic machine that is constantly working as we read it. It is, as Wimsett and Beardsley write, a feat of style. And literary criticism is not about trying to match up that feat of style with the expression of intent by an author, but rather to inhabit and sit with and track that feat of style and to show how it works. And if it lines up with what an author says, all the better. Um, but if not, um, uh, they don't necessarily, aren't necessarily going to lose sleep over it. We might also point out that although what Wolf says is incredibly beautiful, um, and theoretically robust, but it doesn't necessarily tell us a great deal about how to interpret Mrs. Dalloway. It might help us make sense of how to read it, but it doesn't tell us how to arrange or extract or to produce uh, an interpretation of the novel's many competing attitudes and meanings. Okay, so that's another thing we might say about it. All right, so I'm going to pause there. Um, we just sort of complete, we're just sort of completing the first step of our new critical reading, attempting to isolate Mrs. Dalloway away from um, what we might think is Wolf's stated intentions about how she approaches fiction. So we've tried to isolate that away, um, again, not because it doesn't matter, but because it doesn't necessarily prove um, one particular interpretation of how the novel balances its competing attitudes. Um, and meanings. So uh, in the next in the next video, I think it'll be the only other video, I'll try to work through steps two through four um, and and perform or model for you a way in which we might pursue um, a new critical reading of a 200 page novel. okay? All right.